So biases, cognitive biases, play a large role in software engineering when it comes, for example, to estimation tasks, uh, to group effects, and generally the perception when you, for example, debug your code. Uh, one example that I took from a, from a textbook on especially time estimates, how long will a project take, how long will a feature take, um, and which you can look up in the slides is, uh, imagine your boss coming to you and he or she wants to get an estimate on how long a certain functionality will take. Uh, then just by saying certain things, uh, your boss might consciously or not uh, basically push you to give certain answers that are maybe shorter than they should be. For example, if he or she goes, how do you think, how long do you think this little task will take? The little in this word indicates you that it's a small task, it shouldn't take very long, so you will actually adjust your estimates down uh, to make them shorter than they should be. If your boss goes, do you think it will take more than six months? Then you have this six month in your head stuck and even if the task might take two years or two months, you'll have a very hard time to get away from these six months. So you make an estimate that is much, much closer to that. Uh, and then finally, if your boss tries to motivate you and goes, well, you know, this functionality is really important for our company, so uh, if it would be done earlier, this would be really good. Again, uh, this will sort of push you, in many cases, unconsciously to give much shorter estimates. So it's very important to be aware of these kind of effects that are going on and uh, maybe the most important thing is to first accept that these things happen. So it's, it happens to everyone, we are all susceptible to these biases and it's not, uh, no one is really immune to them. So the first one, that's why we start with it, uh, is the so-called confirmation bias. And this is a bias we can observe very much also in politics, in everyday life, in the kind of filter bubbles we nowadays talk a lot about in the current COVID situation. Confirmation bias is the tendency of an individual, of a person to ignore information that goes against your beliefs and pay overly much attention to sources, to uh, information that supports your belief. So basically if you have Republicans and Democrats in the US, for example, you have these very heated debates and if you're on one side, it's really hard to understand why the other person is not following your, your facts, your sources that you give them uh, and they might be t suffering from this because they basically just look at the sources that confirm whatever they think and the others they are ignoring. Similarly, you have very many political arguments in general. Uh, if someone is very, has a very strong opinion on something, they will have a hard time accepting other kind of information. Even if there is evidence, if it's scientific work, it doesn't matter. So this is an extremely strong uh, bias that gets us to basically follow whatever we already believe, basically. Uh, so what we have in software engineering when it comes to confirmation bias is, for example, something that's called positive testing. And that's the tendency that you write tests that confirm your own way of thinking about a certain functionality. For example, you're testing a function and you end up writing tests that mainly test uh, the kind of positive cases, how you think someone should use the function. Uh, and then the classical example is the customer or the user uses it the first time and it instantly crashes because they don't use the application in a way that you envisioned simply because you had the idea that okay this is the way it should work, this is the way the person will use uh, or the programmer will use my functionality. So we tend to do positive testing, um, we tend to search known documentation, so imagine you are trying to uh, find information on, for example, how to use a library, uh, we always favor things that we already know. So we rather go into the documentation, into chapter one that we have already read, uh, because we think there might be something, even though there might be other sources in the documentation that are much more, much more useful. So maybe chapter three uh, is exactly what we're looking for, but we tend to look in the, in the areas that we already know to some extent, um, unconsciously, of course. So, um, then similar effects we see when it comes to changes. Uh, 
we tend to resist large change requests. So if, for example, the customer or an outsider, if you're on GitHub, comes and says, we need to change this, uh, it's a very large change, you know it's a lot of work, uh, then you will unconsciously resist this. You will basically try to find arguments of why is this change request not necessary, uh, maybe there's something smaller that could be done, so we tend to resist this. And that's of course very important if you have a supplier, client or customer relationship, uh, then here there might, the arguments might start that the customer thinks we really need this change uh, and the supplier will try to come up with arguments why that is not needed. Um, so that's another one. And finally, uh, we like to do trade-off studies. For example, you try out something with two architectures, which one is better? Uh, we usually have an opinion. So we tend to ignore results of trade-off studies uh, if they go against our opinion. So again, we'll try to find arguments on why the architecture that we favored in the beginning was better to start with. Why did we, why did we do this? It was clear anyway. Um, Importantly, on all of these things here, I'm not just writing them down, but on all of these there exist studies that have looked into this in detail. So uh, it's not like I'm making this up. There is sufficient evidence that uh, indicates that this is really happening a lot. So the question is what can we do? Um, and the answer is sadly not that easy since, as I said, this is an extremely strong bias and you can observe it in everyday life. Um, there are some, some things that might support these things. For example, positive testing. Uh, one thing we might be want, uh, trying is test-driven development, which has been mentioned earlier in the Agile lectures. So the idea that before you have written the functionality, you might actually want to write the tests, simply because then at least you are thinking a bit more about the use case, about the requirements, and not only about how you implemented it. Um, if you have first implemented a functionality, then it might be harder to get away from exactly how you have designed it. Uh, nevertheless, in order to write a test, you have to think about how, how is the interface of the function, how, how are the parameters, how are the return values, how should it behave. So you do put some thinking into that and there is a chance that you'll anyway do a bit of this positive testing. Um, the other thing that is often mentioned is trace, tracing or traceability. So the idea that you have traces, for example, your code is linked to requirements or the requirements are linked to tests, because then, for example, searching the documentation or talking about change requests might be a bit easier because you have, you cannot just ignore the traces. You cannot say if tests are linked to one requirement, then we'll just start searching in a completely different part of the requirements document. But at least this might support you a little bit. So. These are smaller things, but nevertheless, they are uh, a start, maybe. The other thing, uh, the other bias I'll mention in this video, and then the board is full, so I'll do another one. Uh, the other one we'll talk about here is anchoring bias. And this is the one I gave in my example in the beginning uh, when I said, do you think it will take more than six months? We have the tendency to anchor ourselves, to get stuck to certain numbers or facts that we have heard early on. Um, so it's really hard when you have these six months uh, in your head, don't think about the pink elephant. Uh, it's hard to get away from that. So that's what the anchoring bias is and in software engineering and in many other projects, it's basically the tendency that uh, we have our initial estimates. For example, we estimate that the, uh, that the project will take six months based on very little data. And then later on, when we have a much better uh, understanding of the project, we could make better estimates, but we have a really, really hard time getting away from this. So uh, we have our initial six months and our estimates in the future will always be close to that. So uh, that is, really hard to do. Uh, and there's a lot of estimation going on in software engineering. It's not only about planning time. Um, so it's, it's generally planning information, maybe having group discussions. It's very easy to get angered to these certain things. And techniques that address this a little bit are, for example, uh, parallel estimation. And that is if you think about 
agile development there is for example a practice called planning poker where you have the scrum team and or the XP team uh, and at the same time they sort of reveal what they think uh, a task or user story will take so everyone at the same time says I think it will take two weeks I will t think it takes one week uh, and the idea here is if one person would start, if one person would say, I think it takes six months, then all the others would get anchored to these six months. So if you do it at the same time, there's not as much risk for that. Uh, and then you might get a much broader spectrum and you can actually start discussing. Uh, so you avoid a little bit this single initial estimate that comes in the beginning. Um, the other thing is, of course, estimates are often based on expert opinion. Uh, we can try to get away from that and instead have some kind of model-based estimates. Uh, for example, some kind of formulas that we can apply uh, and you just put some numbers in and then you are either not at all relying on estimates or maybe they're at least not as critical. So the overall duration of the project is not just a person saying, I think it's six months, but it might uh, rely on a number of calculations that are fixed that you don't have to uh, estimate yourself. Okay, so these are the first two. Uh, in particular, you should very much be aware of confirmation bias. It's extremely strong. I'll keep mentioning that um, because it really applies in uh, most everyday life and the software engineering is no exception there.